yeah, let's argue. Bring on all your hot takes, unpopular opinions, and tough questions about anime. I'm ripping this off from The Needle Drop, a show where he argues about music, and I didn't know that Joey the Anime Man was already doing this about anime, but people told me I should do it, so I'm doing it anyways. Let's get right to it. I'm answering what people have given me on Twitter, their hot takes regarding anime. The first one I see on my list is from The Hypocrite, who says, Digitally colored anime is, across the board, ugly and terrible. Anime on cells is just better looking. I think a lot of more serious anime fans than Hippo are going to probably dismiss this out of pocket considering how many gorgeous shows have come out in the last couple of decades that are completely digitally colored. There's a lot of stuff that digital lets you do that cells just don't have the power for. I think of shows by Kyoto Animation or Shaft that have really utilized the digital medium to do things that just weren't possible back during the cell era. Now I understand the appreciation for that more like analog feel that you get from cell animation and I do think that a lot has been lost in the transition to digital especially in the realm of background art the more digital backgrounds get the worse they've been getting and I think that on a baseline you could probably say that the average anime looks worse now than it used to because even if there is usually more consistency in animation there is a lot less consistency in backgrounds but I mean what we really just have to do is compare the absolute best of what was done with cells to the absolute best of what was done with uh, digital painting and honestly I mean it's kind of unfair because during the cell era there was just more expensive anime being made so do I think we've had anything digital that looks as good as Akira or uh, Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust. That's really difficult to say. I mean, let's face it, like, to say that across the board anime looks worse digitally is just a bit of a ludicrous statement. Zen Huxtable says, Kare Kano is greater than Ava. You know, I think this is a pretty reasonable take. I actually think Kare Kano is a stronger directorial effort. I feel as though more heart was put into every single second of animation. It feels even more collaborative than Ava. It just, it feels as though every scene Anno was thinking, how can I make this the most exciting to watch that it possibly could be? Now, I think that the biggest problem Kare Kano has in comparison to Ava is that it's just less complete. With Ava, you've got the whole story, you know, especially if you include End of Evangelion. There's nothing missing. It, it's a total package, whereas with Kare Kano, you know, once you get past episode 18, and I like to think of that as, like, the, the ending and the rest as omake, like, you know, the manga goes on for much longer. Not everybody who goes to read the manga after having watched the anime is satisfied with the manga. So you really have this feeling like we never got the full Kare Kano anime. And so I could say that if we had ever gotten that, I would be more inclined to put it above Ava. The fact that we will never probably have a complete version is sad, but at the same time, it's no use crying over spilled milk. If we just take Kare Kano as like, we've got what we've got, and you like what we've got from it more than Ava, I think that's totally reasonable. I really do think that Ano improved, you know, in the time between Ava and Kare Kano. Um, I think that it's arguably got better, more nuanced characters, and a, you know, in many ways, it is an even deeper story but about something that is more easily digestible it's a story that's just about real life and you know realistic characters whereas Ava obviously has all this extra trappings and stuff there's definitely an argument to be made for either side Nino says the anime community at large has an underlying distaste for people of color tastes in their medium it's why for a long time Shampoo was nowhere near Bebop in the otaku consciousness. Also why shows like Basquash and Michiko Tohachin never hit the big leagues in before SJW. This is a pretty interesting take, especially because of the three shows that were mentioned. And when he says person of color taste, I don't know how many people of color are out there talking about how much they love Basquash and Michiko Tohachin. I mean, maybe it's increased over the years, but at the time that these shows went to air, it was more just like no one was watching them at all. And there were good reasons for that. Both of those shows came out during sort of the anime crash, the end of 2008, beginning of 2009, when a lot of companies were going under, especially Western companies that distribute anime. 
Um, you know, Basquatch, when that started airing, I remember in the anime blogosphere at least, no one was touching it at all. Nobody even knew it existed, basically. It was seen as another wacky Shoji Kawamori vehicle in a sea of wacky Shoji Kawamori vehicles. The first episode is extremely weird. I watched it, you know, at the time because I will watch basically everything, and I ended up dropping it after the first episode. I just didn't think it was that interesting, and like, the way that it handles the reveal of what the story actually is about is very strange. You've got the whole first episode builds you up to like uh, get you introduced to the world and characters and then it like smash cuts to a post-apocalypse after the credits and it's just like what is going on? Michiko Tohachin is also just a very fucking weird show. Like, it's not a show that I would expect to appeal to the masses because it's difficult to follow at times. It doesn't have that consistent of quality in, in, its, in its animation, in the writing. It's kind of all over the place and just fucking weird. But moreover, Studio Manglobe, who created the show, up until that point, I think that they had basically always been banking on uh, catching on in the West. You know, Samurai Champloo had been bigger in the West than it was in Japan. Ergo Proxy had as well. They only made one show every two years, and their third one was Michiko Tohachin, and it came out again at a time when Western anime distribution was falling apart, when, uh, you know, it just didn't have the opportunity to catch on, and eventually it got brought to Toonami. You know, like, once anime started healing and they started bringing more shows over again, that show did make it onto television. And I think it's a little unfair to try and suggest that Samurai Champloo or Michiko Tohachin wasn't, like, a, you know, a fairly big deal considering they made it onto television, which is not a state that most anime anime reach in America. To say that Samurai Champloo is considered lesser than Bebop because of it having more person of color taste is, I think, a bit ludicrous. I'm a huge fan of both shows. I would put Bebop above Samurai Champloo just because it is more consistent. And I mean that in basically every way. The writing quality, the animation quality, you know, it just comes down to sort of what Sunrise and the talent who was there was able to do versus what Manglobe was able to pull together on their very first production. Both of them try to encapsulate a wide variety of styles, but Bebop just feels as though it goes in deeper on each of the styles that it tries to convey than uh, Samurai Champloo does. And Bebop is also just way more unique in terms of setting and characterization. Samurai Champloo is set in samurai times. There is tons of anime set in samurai times. It doesn't feel, you know, as noteworthy as Bebop does for creating an entire universe that feels so detailed and lived in. Characters with much more interesting backstories, because frankly, Mugen's backstory is one of the weakest arcs in Samurai Champloo in my opinion. And there's a lot of just not that great or memorable episodes of Samurai Champloo. I definitely think it hits lower lows, and I'm not saying that every episode of Bebop is amazing, because there are definitely some episodes I don't care for, but I think it's more consistent. Not to mention, it's like you're making it out that these are the shows that people of color are even the most you know, gravitating towards. Dragon Ball Z is, or Naruto are the biggest shows, you know, among, say, like, uh, black anime fandom. So, you know, it's not as though person of color taste is necessarily all that different from person of non-color taste. I mean, once again, I watched all these shows to some extent, and maybe I didn't enjoy Bosquatch as much as Nino did because I think he was watching it partly because it had a cute black girl in it, and he wanted to see that, and that's fine. But it's not resistant to person of color tastes for me to not want to watch the show just for that. So I don't know, I think if maybe you had better examples than these specific cases where I, I think the argument can easily be made for why Samurai Champloo is not as good as Cowboy Bebop. And even then, I mean, I'm not saying it's like an astronomical difference. I love Samurai Champloo and it is a widely beloved, very successful show, especially in the West. But in the cases of like Basquatch and Michiko Tohachin, I definitely think there was a lot of time and place factors in why those shows did not take off. And I think Basquatch, had it come out at the right time, could have easily come to the US and been on something like the Fox Box or some kind of children's programming station, and it could have done a lot better, because it is ultimately a kids show, so it's also not too surprising otaku weren't that invo invested in it. And Michiko Tohachin, again, is just very fucking weird. Dapis says, watching smart and obscure anime for hipster points and internet cred is literally the same as watching seasonal shit so you can talk about it with friends and there is nothing wrong with either. Uh, does anybody just watch obscure stuff 
for hipster cred. I mean, the reason I seek out obscure anime is just so I can try to find something that will appeal to me more. I think that when you're only watching seasonal shows to keep up with the conversation, what you lose out on is just variety. You're only watching stuff that happens to be important to this moment in time and the current cultural zeitgeist, whereas there might be, you know, previous moments where something more interesting happened that you might be inclined towards. And, you know, the more that you grow your tastes and the more that you become sort of desensitized to what is going on in the modern stuff, you know, when you've seen too many of the same types of shows because those are what are popularly being made, you gravitate towards obscure stuff. I don't think people are doing it just for hipster cred, but if that were the case, then sure, it'd be worth making fun of. Attack on Titan is actually pretty good, you just dislike the color brown. I feel as though I've enjoyed some, some brown shows. Let me throw up some brown show that I enjoyed. It's not just that. Attack on Titan's just boring. Evangelion is the most pretentious anime ever that is overanalyzed to hell and back in a pitiful attempt to extract meaning where there is none. Most of the Christian symbology is void of meaning and simply thrown in because it looks cool. He goes on to link an article where uh, Hideaki Anno said so himself. I don't think anybody cares about the Christian imagery in Ava. I think that's been dismissed for a very long time as something that was mostly just there as a stylistic accoutrement. But even that, there is depth in the meta sense of looking into the influences and, you know, what it says about anime culturally and historically that, you know, Anno was taking all these influences from, say, Devilman by Go Nagai, which also uses the same type of Christian imagery in many of the same ways to tell its story and was obviously a big influence on Ava, but like the depth of Ava has nothing to do with the symbolism. It has to do with the fact that the characters are just better written and more nuanced than you almost ever see in anime. I mean, if you're gonna tell me that Ava is not deep, please tell me what you think is deep. What is so deep that Ava's not deep? Because if Ava's not deep, I don't think anything is deep. I don't think anything, I don't even know how you can be deeper. Like, there is no, there's no, like, I feel like everybody has this sense in their mind that there is some insanely deep media out there that, that, you know, that can't be touched and everything else we say is deep doesn't compare to that secretly mega deep thing. There is no secretly mega deep thing. There is no thing that is so deep that it makes Ava look shallow by comparison. At least not to my knowledge. So please, by all means, let me know what you think is so deep that Ava doesn't deserve to be considered deep. Studio Trigger has been downhill since Kill La Kill and will most likely never make anything as good as it ever again. Uh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people love Little Witch Academia. I don't think it would be unfair to put that on the same tier as Kill La Kill in terms of just the inventiveness of it and, you know, solid character writing. It, it isn't the same type of story and I can see why if you want the kind of narrative that Kill La Kill has that you would you know, that you might shy away from something more slice of lifey like Little Witch Academia, but I don't think it's fair to say that it's like not in the same league as Kill La Kill. Um, you know, otherwise, other things they've done have been largely from different subsets of directors. I think people over-glamorize Trigger in the sense that they're expecting everything that they do to be just as good when that was not the case back at Studio Gainax. You know, we all remember the shows that Hideaki Anno or Kazuya Sudumaki or Hiroyuki Maishi made, but there are there's a whole, you know, that's not even half of all the shows that Gainax made. So in Trigger's case, we've got the same kind of story. Yes, everything Imaishi has done is great. The things that Yo Yoshinari has done are great, and a lot of people like Akira Amamiya's style as well, but, you know, there are other directors, younger people working at the studio, making their own marks, and personally, I think the work they're doing is fine. I liked Kizniver, um, you know, I love Space Patrol Luluko, which is Imaishi, and, you know, it's, it's just a, a bunch of shorts. It's obviously not going to be um, of the same magnitude of something like Kill La Kill. But I, I think there's tons of respectable content coming out of Trigger. Um, the fact that, like, I didn't really care for their 2018 output does not make me think that the studio is just shit now when, you know, Imaishi and uh, the guy who wrote Kill la Kill and Girl in the Gun are working on a, a new movie right now. Promare. Looks good. I'm excited about it, you know. Do I think it'll necessarily be as incredible as their other work? Not necessarily, but, you know. I don't think you can just crank out a masterpiece every couple of years. It's just not the way that 
that works. Caribou Coon says people don't want to watch shows that inspired their favorites like Aim for the Ace or Ideon or Rose of Versailles because they're not popular with the current community and fans prioritize interactivity with other fans over anime itself. I definitely agree with you pretty hard on that one, but I will say that I think that with a lot of these older shows, there's more to it than just that. It's also that a lot of newer fans haven't developed a taste for older anime. It looks and feels and sounds very different. If you were just watching, you know, like a bunch of modern shows and then you go back and try to watch those, you're definitely going to feel that difference. Um, pacing is handled differently, writing feels different in a lot of these old shows. You know, they're all really long, so it's definitely going to be taking time away, and you know, the modern anime fan is used to probably most shows being 13 episodes, so going back and trying to watch, you know, 40-something episodes of Ideon, um, a show that is very contentious in its quality, where a lot of people go back and watch it and they report that it is not really worth going back to, or that it is insofar as seeing the influences and, and having interesting things in it, but that you're not going to go back and watch it and find it to be a 10 out of 10. And I think that most anime fans have so much backlog, they have so many things that they've heard are great that they haven't gotten around to, that singling out, you know, some old show is very difficult for them. It, it, I even feel that way myself. Like. People ask me, like, why haven't you watched more Osamu Dezaki shows? And I'm like, you know, I don't necessarily, from what I've seen of them, favor them over more modern shows that I still haven't gotten around to. And I feel like I, you know, I've got such a long list of, you know, unfinished things that I want to see that, you know, the priorities are all over the place. So I'm forgiving towards more modern anime fans for this, but I do think that there's a problem of not enough people willing to go back, willing to make a community effort to go check out these shows. And I think that uh, if you want more of that, you need to make it a community effort. You need to be starting up like a let's watch this on uh, on Reddit or something. Like r slash anime, they do things where they'll, they'll, you know, have like a viewing party of an old show where they just pretend it's currently airing and every week cover another episode and have a discussion about it or get people active in the community. Um, I led a lot of people to watch Revolutionary Girl Utena back in my anime blogging days because I started up this whole thing where I was like, let's all watch and blog Utena. Like everybody who has an anime blog, you should go back and watch Utena. And even though I only ended up covering the first three episodes myself, I got enough other people doing it that it spread throughout the community because bigger people than me were doing it. And suddenly, the amount of people who knew about Utena grew exponentially in that community. So, you know, and that was from me when my blog had less than a hundred readers, you know, like it's not that hard to kickstart something like this if you go about it the right way. Anyway, my camera's about to die, so that's it for this episode of Let's Argue. I got literally hundreds, if not thousands, of responses, so I could probably make a few more of these just off of what I've got, but you know, keep up with the Twitter if you want to be able to react to the next time one of these goes up. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you then. Bye.